Blue all over this sanctuary. You're looking good in all the shades of your blue. And you know blue is because we are focusing today on what emotion? Sadness. Y'all got it right. Sadness. That's right. We're looking at sadness today. And toward that end, I want to ask if you would turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19, starting at verse 1. I read from the New Revised Standard Version of the text. Follow along whatever version you have. 1 Kings 19, starting at verse 1. And I'll read verses 1 through 9. 1 Kings 19, 1 through 9. When you found it or see it, won't you say amen? 1 Kings 19, starting at verse 1. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Follow along whatever version you have. Here's what it says. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up, he fled for his life, he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. Verse 7 says, the angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat or the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the, the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? That is the word of the Lord. It's already blessed. You may be seated in this place. Family, for the few moments of the mind today, allow me to preach as you pray in the Lord in power from the theme, strength through your sadness. Strength through your sadness. Sisters, brothers, cousins, and kin, at the beginning of this month, we began a series inspired by the movie Inside Out 2. The animated film, which takes us inside the mind of a girl named Riley, in order to show us how her emotions influence her daily decisions, her reactions, and her interactions with others. Each week now, we focused on a different emotion that showed up in character form in the mind of the main character, Riley. We began by focusing on the emotion of joy. Deacon Stokeland, we were reminded that we have a right to joy. Joy is part of our inheritance. God wants us to experience joy. Joy is our resistance in a world plagued by racism, sexism, militarism, and many other forms of society violence. Uh, to ground ourselves in an abiding joy is a way to resist succumbing to the venom of spiritual and material wickedness in high and low places. Joy is also our birthright. Crystal, despite the gruesome chapters of dehumanization 
experienced by our ancestors in the Ma'afa, chattel slavery, the Jim Crow South, and the Jim Crow North, and so much more, those on whose shoulders we stand still found a way to radiate joy in their existence through love, song, dance, and many other forms of merriment. Sister Donna, this kind of joy is rooted in our relationship with God and one another. This kind of joy stands firm in the face of trials, tribulations, and the vicissitudes of life. Then last week, we turned to anger. Anger, Austin Monet, is another main character in the movie and is a close companion to joy. We focused last week on how anger is a do-something emotion that often helps to get us to get started with addressing serious personal or social issues. Shannon, anger is often a necessary combustion in the face of social injustice, personal wrongdoing, or imminent danger. In the church, anger has been for too long completely banished as an emotion that we should not experience at all. But we were reminded last week, that, wait a minute, God feels anger. And if God feels anger by testimony of the written word, the, scripture, the scriptures are also clear that humans feel anger. We breathed a collective sigh of relief last week when we realized that anger does not have to, and in fact cannot be, completely exercised from the human experience for us to be good people or even good Christians. The Holy Writ last week gives us and gave us godly wisdom in Ephesians 4.26, where we were, we were reminded last week that we must harness the power of anger. Because left unchecked, anger will block you from using your best judgment. Anger can cloud your mind. Anger can take you 100 miles in the wrong direction and give you more to clean up after the dust settles. Say amen if you can. Therefore, last week we learned that when it comes to anger, we must lean into it. Be honest that you feel it. We must limit it, put it on a leash, and we must release it, for if we hold it too long, it can do harm to us and everybody around us as well. We sat with joy. We sat with anger. And today, the visitor that we have at the door is the emotion of sadness. This week we focus on the character and emotion of sadness and the character of sadness in the movie Inside Out 2 is another legacy character to the cinematic film. Sadness was in Inside Out 1 and now is in the sequel. In the first installment of the movie, sadness was an emotion that was suppressed in Riley's mind. Joy worked over time to keep sadness preoccupied and at bay. And one of the lessons that was derived from the first installment of the movie was that sadness should not be suppressed. Like all of the other emotions, sadness has a seat at the table that should not be challenged. Sadness is a part of the human experience. Sadness comes with the package given to us by God. Sadness has a role to play. Sadness has a job to do. And while sadness does not feel good, sadness is doing a good work in helping us to see some things, live through some things, and balance some things out in our minds. And in Inside Out 2, it goes a step further from the first movie. In the first movie, Sadness was suppressed, but by the end of it, we learned that sadness has a job to do. 
But in the sequel that just came out, it goes a step further in not only validating the importance of sadness, but in this latest movie, sadness has a starring role in being a part of the solution to the main character's troubles. While the main character of the movie, whose name is Riley, while Riley was dealing with the burden of anxiety, it was sadness that had the know-how and that was strategically placed to help stop the mental assault on the main character. Sadness was in the right place at the right time with the right know-how to stop the challenges that were going on in Riley's mind. Said more simply, in the movie, sadness helped to solve the problem. I'm going to say that again. In the movie, sadness helped to solve the problem. This sent me on a trip, Minister Antoine, because it really did swim against the grain of what we are taught about sadness. Sadness is something to quickly get over. Sadness is something to very uh, rapidly put behind you. Sadness is something you don't share with other people because you don't want them to feel uncomfortable. Sadness is something that if you go through it, do it quickly and get it over with because we have better things to do. But in this movie, sadness is not pushed to the side. Sadness is lifted up as being a part of the solution to the problem. And so you know what that did for me? I started looking through the scriptures because I wanted to see sadness in the word and see how sadness has been used of God or sadness has helped to get people through a tough situation. Family and Brother Deacons, you, you might find it interesting that as I engaged in my study, you might find it inter interesting to know that I found it very difficult to find many instances of the word sad in scripture. According to blueletterbible.com, the word sad only occurs 11 times in 10 verses in the King James Version of the Bible. To find sadness in the Bible, in most instances, you have to look beyond the semantics and find its symptoms. You'll have to know what sadness looks like because in many instances, sadness will show itself before it announces itself. What I'm saying here is that in the scriptures, you'll be hard pressed to find anybody who stands up in the story and says, I'm sad. Now, there were some sad scenarios in Scripture. There are some heartbreaking situations in the Bible. There are some destructive moments in the various passages and parables that we read about. But you will be hard-pressed to find anybody who in the middle of what they're going through will stand up, raise their hand, and say, I'm sad. Don't announce it. Because oftentimes with sadness... It will show itself before it announces itself. So you got to know what sadness look like to know when it's in the room. You got to know what sadness looks like in order to help those that you love and those in your home or those in your family. Because when we're feeling sad, it can be difficult to open our mouths and say, I'm sad. And if all of us push the rewind button of our own human experience, you can point to moments when you were downright sad. And in those same moments, you had difficulty expressing to other people the depth of the weight you felt in your emotional being. Because sadness don't grab the mic. Sadness just gets on stage. Sadness starts showing up like... You lost interest in things you used to care about. Sadness will show up where you used to hang out with the crew, but now you find yourself regularly absent, so much so that they've stopped inviting you to go out. Sadness will just show up 
You have difficulty functioning in day-to-day decisions and you can't even get through the day because you are so weary in your mind that another decision feels like too much to do right now. Sadness will just show up. And I don't care who you are. I don't care what kinds of accolades you have. I don't care what letters are behind your name or what titles are in front of your name. Every single last one of us know what it is to have a chapter, a season, a day, a moment full of sadness. Can I get a witness in here? And really, I can park the car right there because this is one of the last places that people like to come to admit they are sad. This is one of the last places where we are given license to embrace the fullness of our human experience as it deals with the emotion of sadness. From the minute we come in this kind of place, we come in and we hear the encouragement to clap your hands, stand up, jump, flip, roll on the floor, bounce off the wall, sing the song, and hang from the chandelier because God has been good. Oh, I know I'm right about it. I know I'm right about it. And for some who don't feel all of that, you can feel like you're doing God and your church a disservice because while everybody else is bumping off the walls, you feel an anchor in your soul that is grounding you in the floor and you couldn't put your hands together if you wanted to. Good God have mercy. I'm in the house today. You know why I know I'm in the house? Because I know what sadness looks like. (laughs) You know, I I know I'm in the house. Because everybody in here did not come today with a song on your heart. I know what sadness looks like. Everybody in here did not come with lightness in your feet and joy bells ringing in your soul. I know what sadness looks like. You're pressing because you know it's the right thing to do. But if you could, you would have rolled over in the bed and stayed under the covers and told the world to leave you alone. know you in the room because I know what sadness looks like when people greet you I know what it looks like to give a pat answer in response to their greeting but you know you just lied right to their face and you lied because you're not even sure they can handle the truth of the words that's anchored to your sadness. Say amen if you can. Can I just get some honest Christians up in here today who can say every now and then when I press my way to church, I'm not pressing my way because I feel good. I'm not pressing my way because everything's going well. I'm not pressing my way because I have no problems. I'm pressing my way because I am sad and the weight of my emotions is pulling me down oh where are you in the house today people who are sad but press their way anyhow (laughs) people who cried all night like all night last night but you press your way anyhow people who cried so much that your tears have run out but you press your way anyhow this might not be for everybody but for anybody in here who's ever felt the weight of sadness even on a Sunday morning I got some good news just for you God has you in mind today. God got some mail with your name on it. God got an answer for your sadness. God got some fuel for your dilemma. God got some medicine for your mayhem. God's going to give you something today in the midst of your sadness. So that by the end of this day, you will leave out of here saying, I came in sad. Watch this. And even if I leave out sad, I leave out with faith in a God who can show up in the midst of my sadness. And what I can learn today is that I can hear God even when I'm sad. Good Lord, have mercy. I I appreciate safe space, to be honest. And because it's Sunday, I got safe space to confess. I've lied in church. How you doing today? I'm great. I'm fine. All is well. But behind all of that was a sad soul. Behind all of that was a broken heart. Behind all of that was grief and loss. Because I said something that was not true what I was feeling but that's why I love today's text 
I love today's text because it's the kind of text that gives us the room to recognize that even with big titles, credentials, public success, even with status, even being the life of the party, even with everything else you got going on, sadness can be your experience too. There's right here in our text, it gives us an example. Because here in this text, the prophet Elijah, mighty man of God, in fact, one of the most celebrated, powerful prophets in all of the Bible is featured in this text. Elijah was a bad somebody. Elijah had a connection with God so that God would do works through him that others would see. He would send, God would send words through him that others would hear. And there was no doubt that this prophet of God had a strong and firm connection with the Lord. The prophet Elijah in this particular part of the Bible had just performed a mind-blowing work as God gave him strength. He just stood up to about 400 prophets of another God. He just stood up to a large group of other ministers of a different God and challenged them to a competition. To see whose God was the real God. Prophet Elijah being a gentleman, he allowed the other prophets to go first. Y'all call your God to bring down fire to consume the sacrifice on the altar. And Elijah stood back and watched as these other ministers of another God called on their God to prove who was the real God and called on their God to bring fire from on high. It said they kept on screaming for him. And the prophet Elijah said, maybe talk a little louder. Maybe your God can't hear you calling. Maybe your God went to the bathroom. Maybe your God went on vacation. Let's see what you got. And you know what happened? Nothing. They called and they called. And nothing happened. Then it was the prophet Elijah's turn. The Bible says that after the prophet Elijah gave them their chance, then in my spiritual imagination, I see the prophet Elijah cracking his knuckles, stepping forward to the altar. In calling on the name of the Lord. The story goes that God sent down the fire that consumed the sacrifice on the altar. And it was crystal clear whose God was the real God. Whose God was the big deal God. Whose God was the only God that could hear the petition and cry of one person. And one person was enough to have God move from heaven and show a sign in the earth. Could God have mercy? It's not on my page, but it's in my spirit. It was just one person. It wasn't hundreds upon hundreds. It was one person who called on God and one person's voice was enough for God to show up. Why? Because God's reputation was on the line. This wasn't about Elijah being lifted up. It was about God's name being lifted up. And God said, I will not allow this to transpire and my name be defamed. God sent down fire. The prophet Elijah was right there bearing witness and everybody around saw and understood who, who the real God was in the land. Now, I got to give you that context and background because it flows into today's scripture. And I know it might throw you off because in the scene I just shared with you, the prophet Elijah was the man in charge. God moved through him to show a fantastic work that nobody could deny. But because of his faithfulness to the Lord, the Bible says that Jezebel sent out word and said, all right, Elijah, because you have killed my prophets, because you have embarrassed our administration, now I will make your life 
like the lives of these prophets that you have killed because of this action. One moment, Elijah is the ancient I see. He is the man. In the next moment, the scriptures say he's running for his life. He had a mountaintop experience. And immediately after his mountaintop experience, he is running in the valley of the shadow of death. The Bible says in verse 3 of the text that he was afraid. He got up, he ran for his life, and he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. The Bible says he left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey in the wilderness. And he came and sat down under a solitary broom tree, also known as a juniper tree. And he asked that he might die. Wasn't this the prophet Elijah? Wasn't this the mighty man just used of God? Wasn't this the man who was just on the stage being used of the Lord to declare God's power in front of everybody? Yeah. But after he leaves the stage, after he leaves the crowd, when it's just he, him, himself, by himself, he's lying down in the wilderness under a tree and ready to die. Oh, my Lord, family, this is not one of those scriptures where Elijah is said to explicitly be sad. But we know now that sadness often won't announce itself. Sometimes it just shows itself. And so I ask you to read the scripture with an eye to see where sadness is. He's by himself under the tree. He's saying, I should die. He doesn't seem to have any energy or vigor or words anymore. Some biblical scholars have said that Elijah in this passage was depressed. I'm a little hesitant to apply modern day psychological assessment to an ancient biblical literature in order to assess a clinical diagnosis for a biblical character. And so I can't say if he had clinical depression or not. What I can say is, whatever it was, sadness was in the room. Sadness was right there. And the question is, how can we find strength even in our sadness? Sadness has such a spectrum and a range that it's the kind of thing that God has to give some kind of tailor-made specific response to because your sadness may not be my sadness and my sadness may not be yours. For some, your sadness is anchored in grief of the loss of a loved one. And while others have moved on with their lives, you still feel the weight of the sadness that holds you down and pulls you back and zaps your energy. For others, it's the sadness of things changing in your body right under your nose that while you thought you were the picture of health, a surprise diagnosis or a surprise doctor's visit has led you to a place where mentally you're dealing with some heavy stuff because you in your mind thought you were the picture of health but now you got paperwork that suggests otherwise your sadness may not be my sadness your sadness may be connected to a relationship that's fallen to pieces and while in the beginning it was a picture perfect postcard now you can't even understand the nightmare that you are living in your sadness may not be like my sadness your sadness may be connected to your children and you know all you did to raise them right and sacrifice for them and give to them and you wanted them to go a certain way and do a certain thing. No, you knew they couldn't be identical to you. In fact, you wanted them to be better than you, but as they've grown up, they've made their own decisions, gone in their own path, doing their own thing, and you recognize now that they are of age, you don't have the same kind of power to make them do anything and it frustrates you. And you get sad. Oh, your sadness may not be like my sadness. And my sadness may not be like your sadness. But the reality is, wherever your sadness calls home, God can help you right there. I, I'm a witness that God can help you no matter what your sadness looks like. And in our scripture today, 
this prophet of God, this mighty man of God used of the Lord to do an awesome work in front of the people is downright sad. He's under a tree. He said, I'm ready to die. It's over. He says, I'm no better than my ancestors. God, just take me now. But look what happens. What happens in the story can help us get some strength through our sadness. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says that when Elijah laid down under the tree, the Bible says in verse 5, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up. Get up, get up, get up. This is my first point. It, it lets us know that, that, that sometimes God will send you some provisions that you've not even prayed for. I'm going to say it again. God will send provision that you've not even prayed for. Because the Bible says that when the angel told him to get up and eat, that Elijah looked and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones in a jar of water. That right there in the midst of his sadness, laying down in the middle of the desert under a tree and ready to die, God sends an angel with some provision for the man of God that he did not even pray for. I hope you caught that. The prophet did not pray for nourishment. The prophet prayed for death. But God knew which prayer to reject and knew what he needed instead. Good God have mercy. I'm here to help somebody that sometimes God will show up with some provision that you've not even prayed for. Maybe because you're not even the right mind to pray for what you actually need. But I'm so glad in this moment that God knows our hearts even when our mouth ain't acting right. And God said, I'm going to give you what you need. I will provide some provision that you've not even prayed for. I dare somebody under the sound of my voice to think back to a time when God blessed you with some nourishment God blessed you with some support God blessed you with some resources God blessed you with a hug God blessed you with some love love and some support that you did not even pray for has anybody in here ever experienced God giving you provision that you've not even prayed for Hallelujah. And I'm so glad because in the midst of our sadness, sometimes our words don't come out right. You can be so sad you can't think straight. And God says, even in the midst of your sadness, I got you. I got you when you don't got you. I got you when everybody else is not around. I'm still there. And I'm going to give you what you need, even the stuff you don't even pray for. So if you're one of these people that when the weight of the world is on your shoulders, your prayers don't come out right. You get all tongue-tied. Your mind is not focused. You are confused. You are trying to make it through a fog in your brain. Rest assured that you are still in the hands of God. Rest assured that even when you can't see God, God still got God's eye on you. Rest assured that God will send angels to get by your side and get in your kitchen and put a meal together and put a cool drink by your head. God will take care of you. God gave Elijah in the midst of his sadness, gave him provision without prayer. Didn't pray for it, just gave it to him. And I need to help somebody who are caregivers to people who may be feeling sadness. Because I love what the scripture says. <laughs> Dean Good, I'm blown away by the fact that God sends the angel while Elijah is sleeping. The angel is cooking in some kitchen somewhere, brings a birthday cake and a cool drink. And then look, the angel touches Elijah, wakes him up and says, get up and eat. And I tried looking at this in different versions because I felt it was a little direct and assertive to just say, get up and eat. That the angel did not ask, are you hungry? The angel did not inquire about Elijah's appetite. 
The angels just said, get up and eat. And without Elijah, without Elijah having to ask for anything, the angel just showed up with something that would help. And can I talk to people who have people in your life that you love and care about who might be weighed down by sadness? Can I help you? Sometimes asking them what they need is the wrong approach. Good Lord have mercy. I know I'm on somebody's street. One of the things you will want to avoid when dealing with a sad person is asking them to think about what they need. Because in the moment of your sadness, you're just trying to survive the situation. You can't even put your brain around what you need. You need somebody who loves you enough, who cares about you enough, who watches you enough, who's attentive to you, who knows how you move, who knows what you feel, who can step up and say, get up. It's time to eat. And in those moments, you can feel so supported because somebody, without even asking you, has brought you exactly what you needed. And so, so after the funeral, we're not going to ask, what do you need? After their lives have been turned upside down, we're not going to say, call me if you need anything. We're going to be like the angel. And it might come off a little straight, but it's because I love you and I care about you. Get up. It's time to eat. To show up. To extend support. To, to be there so much so that without you even saying it, I'm going to be there with something to help you. God, God, God sends the angel and thereby God provides provision without prayer. In the midst of Elijah's sadness, there's provision without prayer, but also there is persistence without apology. In verse 7, after Elijah gets up and eats the meal, the Bible says Elijah lays back down. He goes back to sleep. And look what the angel of the Lord does. The angel of the Lord, the Bible says, came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank again. The scripture shows that there was persistence from this angel without apology. In other words, I'm going to stay right here with you in the midst of what you're feeling in your sadness. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to be there for you. I'm not going to turn my back on you. I'm going to stay here with you. And in fact, even if I can't fix what's at the root of what you're feeling, you at least will know you are not here by yourself. And family, every now and then, we just want some kind of encouragement that we are not here by ourselves. We are sensible enough even in our sadness to know that there is not a person who can fix what you're going through. You live long enough to realize that chapters come in this life where mama can't help you and daddy can't fix it and brother and sister can't solve it so you're clear enough to know that they can't fix it but you appreciate the fact that when people stay there with you in the midst of what you're going through at least you can rest in the fact that you are not by yourself is there anybody else here who knows that there's a good feeling when you got people around you who just going to stay there with you in the middle of your trouble, who going to stay there with you in the midst of your tears, who's going to stay there with you, not trying to solve everything all the time, not trying to give you an antidote for your problems, not trying to give you medicine for everything you going through. No, I'm just going to stay here with you. Good God have mercy. And sometimes you just need people to stay there even if they don't know what to say. Good God have mercy. Just, just stay here with me. Even if you don't know what to say, I just want to know that I'm not all by myself. I just want to know that when I look over, you'll be right there. I just want to know that if I got to cry, we're going to cry together. I just want to know that if I got to go through, I got somebody I can go through with. And here is the beauty of being a believer. That that, that should not rest solely on brothers and sisters, but when it comes to the Lord, we serve a God who will be with us in the middle of whatever we are going through. 
Thank you, Lord. We serve a God who said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. So when everything falls by the wayside, don't worry, I'm still right here. When you don't look like your best on day-to-day basis, it don't matter. God says, I'm still going to be right here. You're crying sloppy tears all over your face. God said, it don't matter. I'm going to be right here. Your heart was just broken. God said, that's all right. I'm going to be right here. You just went through a big shift in your life, but God says, that's all right. I'm going to be right here and I'll just love the Lord because the Lord says I'm going to be with you even when others are nowhere around is there a witness in the house is there a witness in the house that, that sometimes we'll reach for people just because we don't want to be by ourselves, but when they don't return the call, when they don't return the text, when they get too busy for your schedule, when it's time for them to move on with their life, you keep on reaching for people. I came to encourage you today that there's nobody like the Lord who can be with you when you need the promise of God's presence. God will be right there. God will be with you. The angel persisted without apology. I'm going to be here. And I'm going to nudge you again and say, get up and eat. Girl, I love you too much to leave you like this. Bro, I can't leave you like this on the side of the road. I'm going to be right here and I'm going to persist without apology. I'm not going to ask your permission to stay here. I'm going to be here to help you get through your sadness. When you're trying to find some strength through your sadness... You got to know that there is provision without prayer that God will provide for you in the midst of your sadness. You got to know that when you're trying to find strength in your sadness, you got to know that God will send some persistence without apology. That when others get tired, when others get too busy, when others need to move on, God said, I ain't going nowhere. I'll pour too much in you. I know you too well. I created you. I formed you. I fashioned you. I knew you before you was born. And you need to know that no matter what you're going through, I ain't going to leave you here right now. If everybody else leave, I will be the one that stays with you until the end of time. Persistence without apology. But without apology. But, but finally, beloved, finally, what I love about the scripture is that when you're trying to find some strength through your sadness, the Bible gives us a glimpse into God's thinking about you, even in your sadness. Because in the scripture, after the angel nudged and got him up the second time, the angel of the Lord went to Elijah and said, get up and eat. Watch this. Or the journey will be too much for you. Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much. Somebody just missed what the angel said. In the beginning of the passage, Elijah prayed for his life to end. In the beginning of the story, Elijah was ready to flick the lights off and call it quits. But by this point in the scripture, After the angel has served as a divine chef for the prophet of God, served him up cakes and water, the angel slides something in at the appropriate time when Elijah could hear it and say, you got to eat because your journey is not over yet. Good. Lord have mercy. And this might be for somebody under the sound of my voice or maybe just me. (laughs) But every now and then we need a reminder that no matter what you are sad about, this is not the final chapter of your story. No matter what you are going through, no matter how gargantuan it seems to you, no matter how much of a mountain it feels like in your spirit, I hear God telling me to tell you, your story is not over. (laughs) Your story is not finished. Your your journey will continue. And watch this. The angel said to the prophet Elijah, you got to eat because you got places to go and you got things to do and you got people to meet. And I just want to encourage somebody today. I want to let you know today that your journey is not over. I said your journey is not over, but you have to get going with your journey because you got things to do. God has plans for your life. God has meaning for your journey. God will take your heartbreak and pull a testimony out of it. God will take your roughest moment and give you some fuel to transform your life. Your journey is not over. Go ahead and tell your neighbor your journey is not over. It's not over. Tell them it's not over. And what I love about it 
is while Elijah's journey was not over, what was over was his thinking that his life was over. God says, no, let me correct you there. Your journey is not over. You got to keep moving. You got to keep running. You got to keep believing. You got to keep running. Watch this. And so the angel fed Elijah and gave him some nourishment, some strength for the journey. But Sister Maxine, do you know what journey the angel was referencing? The journey that the angel was referencing in the passage was not a journey back to work. It was not a journey, it was not a journey back to the friendship circle. The Bible says that Elijah once strengthened went 40 days and 40 nights and on the other end of the journey was a meeting with God. Lord have mercy. He traveled to the mountain called Horeb, also known as Sinai, which was the mountain of God. The very place that Moses traveled to hear from God. Now Elijah travels to hear from God. The angel gave him food enough to make it to the meeting with God. I'm so glad <laughs> that the angel said you got a journey ahead of you and that the scripture gives us the clarity of what journey he's talking about. The angel said your appointment is coming up. Your meeting is coming. What, what you need in your spirit is on the other side of this journey. And so for anybody who feels like you're in the midst of your journey, working through seasons of sadness, angels keep on showing up to give you just enough to make it through another nap, another day, another moment. But your journey will not be over. Your journey continues and pushes you into a meeting with Almighty God. Elijah has a meeting with God. And God asked Elijah, what are you doing here? God wasn't asking for the address. God wasn't asking for him to pull out his map. God said to Elijah, what are you doing here? It was an introspective question. It was one to get Elijah thinking again. What are you doing here? And in that meeting with God, after that, Elijah gets what he needs to fulfill the purposes and design of God on his life. I'm going to my seat. It's time for us to get on up out of here. But I just came today with my blue on to help somebody in the season of sadness to know that your journey is not over to let you know that God will send you provision that you didn't even pray for. So release yourself from feeling the pressure of having highfalutin prayers all the time because sometimes you won't feel like you can get a prayer through. But that's all right. God will answer your prayers that you don't even pray for and give you some provision in the midst of your situation. And I'm so glad that not only will God give you provision that you didn't pray for, as I go to my seat, I'll tell you right now that God will also persist without apology. God ain't going nowhere. You can be grumpy all you want to. God says we're going to be grumpy together then. You can be mad all you want to. God said I will sit with you in your anger. God said I ain't going nowhere. I brought you too far. I brought you a long way. I brought you through hills and mountains. I brought you through valleys and clefts. I ain't going nowhere. I brought you through sickness and death. I ain't going nowhere. I was there when you didn't have a dime to your name so I ain't going nowhere I'm going to stay right here with you you may roll over in your bed but I'm going to stay here with you I'm going to persist for you I'm going to labor with you I'm going to hold on to you and not ask for your permission because you are my
mine and I'm going to take care of you. But finally, there is a pronouncement that gets Elijah back on his feet. And that pronouncement is your journey is not over. You got to keep on going. You got to keep on pushing. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to talk with you. I'm going to tell you that I am, I am your child. I am so thankful today that God will go with you the whole way. Not just on joyful days. Not just on good days. God says I'm going to go with you the whole way. So if you are sad today, I'm just here to encourage you to praise God in your sadness. Whisper a thank you with your sadness because your sadness is not too much for God. God says I got a journey for you. Why? Because we got a meeting on the other side. There's a meeting that I'm waiting for. And one of these old days, after many days of toil, one of these old days, after many years of strife, after these old days, after many days of labor, I got a meeting on the other side. Is there anybody here who says, I got a meeting? I'm working, but I got a meeting. I'm pushing because I got a meeting. I may be crying, but I got a meeting. I got a meeting with the Lord. I can't wait to see him, to see him for myself. I can't wait to get there when all the tears are gone, when all the work is over, when all the sickness is done. There's a meeting that I'm waiting for, and I'm going to see him for myself. Is there anybody here who is waiting for that meeting? That meeting in the air. Is there anybody here that's waiting for your meeting with the Lord? And when I see him, I just want to hear him say, Well done. Well done. I know it was hard, but well done. I know you cried, but well done. I know it was tough, but well done. My good and faithful servant, well done. You persevered, well done. You took it one day at a time, well done. You cried your tears, well done. My good and faithful servant, come on up. I'll make you ruler over many. Stand to your feet all over the church. Some strength, some strength for my sadness. If you're here today, the door of the church of Jesus Christ is open. If you're here today and you've been waiting for an honest place to to just admit that you're feeling sadness. You've been faking out a lot of other people. Going through the motions being highly functioning and producing and nobody would ever know that behind all that is sadness. We try to push it down, hold it back, but sadness says, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't push me back. There's a work that I can do to help you get through. Get to the other side. This book by Brene Brown that I referenced two weeks ago continues to bless me because the text says that when you're sad, One of your deepest longings is just to have somebody be with you. Somebody who can relate. Even if their source of sadness is not identical to yours. I just want to know where's the tribe of the sad people? Because I don't understand meeting people 
who never seem to have a sad moment. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Somebody, somebody needs to see this. Can every person who's ever struggled with sadness just raise your hand? Thank you. I, I wanted people to see that they're not by themselves. And if you're here today and you need a space and a place where you won't be pushed into a praise every 3.9 seconds but you can show up and people with spiritual insight can give you the right hug at the right moment a word of encouragement without judging you if you're here today I want to tell you this is the church for you this is the church where you can get support where you can be loved without judgment. This is a church where we are practicing being fully human because God gave us this package and was just trying to understand what it means to show up fully the way that God intends. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ in your life, can I invite you to come on and walk down the aisle, give me your hand, give God your heart, or you don't have a church home, but you know you need one, and this feels like this is the right place, don't resist it. Let God do what God is doing. Step out of the pew, walk down the aisle and say, you know what, I, I think I want to join. I want to be a church. I want to be a part of a church like that. We're going to sing one line of this, and if you're here, won't you come? And then I'm going to pray. If you're here, won't you come? Is there one today? Is there one? What a friend we have in Jesus. Is there one today who says, you know what? I want to be a part. Matter of fact, not just I want, I need to be a part of a place where my whole self can show up. I can get the support somebody who just said you need to eat something come on I made you something without asking you I'm gonna be here with you until we both hear the Lord pronounce something over your life to say your journey is not over keep coming keep coming oh what peace we often forfeit oh what needless Because we do not carry everything as I continue softly won't you reach out and grab hands with your neighbor I just want to pray for you I just want to pray for you because for many of us we have perfected looking publicly unaffected by the emotion of sadness we have perfected it. You know why? Because it doesn't always feel safe enough for us to be honest about what we feel. Or, in the spirit of not trying to be a bother, I don't want to be. I don't want to be trouble to nobody. Don't don't make a fuss about me. We reject the support that's right there next to us and been there the whole time we tell ourselves a story that nobody is there but the truth is you got people all around you so I'm going to pray and as you hold hands with your neighbor I want you to be thoughtful about what you might not even know they're going through. 
be thoughtful, not nosy. Truth is, you don't need to know the details. But you can still extend some care. Let me pray. Gracious Lord, we pray, Lord, for every person under the sound of my voice, every person watching online, who knows what it is to sit in sadness. And somewhere on the spectrum of sadness, they have experienced in the past, or they feel it right now. For some, on the spectrum of sadness, they're sitting in grief. And Lord, I pray that you tend well to them right where they are. I pray, Lord, that instead of feeling rushed through their grief, that they feel support and safety in their grief. For deep grief is often evidence of deep love. So, Lord, meet them in their grief. For others, on the spectrum of sadness, it's depression. Perhaps even a clinical depression. God, I pray that you remind us of your presence in the midst of depression. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you break through the depressive wall and if nobody else can get in radiate your love your compassion your safety and support to those feeling depression Lord remind us that you've sent some people with insight expertise and information who are called therapists in some ways who can serve as ministers to our minds so God I pray that for those that need therapists psychologists or even medication Whatever barriers exist that keep them at distance from what they need to be balanced, healthy, and whole, remove them now, Lord. And send angels with cake and water to help give them what they need in the midst of a diagnosis or an emotional state. Wherever we have been or are on the spectrum of sadness help us to find strength in the sadness Lord send angels please for some they've prayed so much they don't even know what to pray no more they have literally run out of words thank you for being the God who can answer the prayers that we don't even pray I pray for provision for them I pray, Lord, that you persist in your presence without apology. Be there and help us to know that you're always there. And remind us as well that our journey is not over. There's more. Sadness sometimes, Lord, makes us feel like this is the end when sometimes it's just the beginning, another beginning. A new chapter help us to believe that in you precious Jesus intercede on our behalf mighty intercessor Holy Spirit take our groanings our moanings our utterings translate them God that we get what we need in the midst of our sadness Finally, Lord, we won't be stingy. We're holding the hands of a brother or a sister. And I don't know, but they just might need you to show up in the midst of their sadness. So right now, in the strong name of Jesus, 
We pray, Lord, that you would cover them with your protection and your peace. Squeeze that hand. Lord, I pray that you give them the power that they need to take it just one day at a time. Come on, give that hand a slight squeeze. God, I pray right now to press in some peace in their lives. I'm pressing in joy in their lives. I'm pressing in a healthy sadness in their lives. Lord, in the name of Jesus, give them what they stand in need of. Come on, give that hand a slight squeeze. Lord, I pray that you remind them of this right now, that when they feel all by themselves, bring back to their minds this feeling, this moment, this sensation of someone squeezing their hand to let them know that they are not by themselves. Devil, you are a liar. So every lie from the pit of hell that would try to convince them that they are all alone, that they are solitary and isolated from everybody, that something is wrong with them, that everybody else has it all figured out in the strong name of Jesus. God, I pray that you remind them of this moment. Squeeze that hand. Remind them of the feeling of the strength they feel right now. Remind them, Lord, of the sensation of being embraced, of being touched, of being loved, of being prayed for in the strong name of Jesus. Send every angel you got to help my sister get out of the pit of her situation. Send every angel you have, Lord, to help my brother make it through the silent dark moments of the night of his life and let him know that he can make it through. Do a work in this house. Do a work in this house. Do a work in this house that heals, that delivers, that sets free in the name of Jesus. And every believer, every happy believer, every sad believer, every joyful believer, if you believe it by faith, say amen. Amen and amen. Come on, put your hands together. Hallelujah, Lord. Come on, hug your brother, hug your sister. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah, Lord. You are not by yourself. You're going to make it. We're going to make it. Because there's more to our journey.